Welcome to Winchester Cafe Sci. If you enjoyed tonight's talk and you would like to be notified about future ones, you can sign up to, for our newsletter at our website, wincafesci.org.uk. Tonight's speaker is a best-selling science writer, the author of The Quantum Astrologer's Handbook and co-host of the Eureka podcast with Rick Edwards. Praised as a wonder by Tim Harford, his book, The Maths That Made Us, is a fascinating journey through the history of civilization that shows why maths is fundamental to our understanding of the world. Please welcome Michael Brooks. Um, so uh, thank you very much for coming out. It's uh, rather nice to see so many people turn out for a talk on maths uh, because it's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, let me just uh, take the temperature of the room, if I may. Uh, can you put your hands up if you feel you have a positive relationship with numbers? Uh, quite a lot, yes. Okay, and who would who here would say they have a quite a negative or neutral relationship with numbers? Never really engaged with maths and, and things like that. Okay, very, very few. Probably what you should expect at a, a cafe style, I guess. Um, but uh, what, you're, what you find is when you um, ask the general population, uh, there's around 36%, and this is usually um, actually sort of uh, independent of, of culture and country, uh, about 36% of people, 36% of school children uh, have a, a huge problem with maths and uh, end up with something called maths anxiety, uh, which basically means that you have a kind of negative emotional reaction if you're ever asked to do anything with numbers, like even as far as splitting a, a restaurant bill. Uh, that can be too much for, for many people and some people that I know, certainly. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, about tonight is why that is, why that's not a problem, uh, why we should kind of embrace it and try and solve this problem. And really, but uh, along the way, I want to introduce you to all of the things uh, that maths has achieved uh, in human civilization, uh, which for me is basically the whole of human civilization is dependent on maths and numbers and nobody gives it enough credit. So that's where we're going. Um, so this is this is my book, which uh, obviously you'll be wanting to buy uh, by the end of this talk. Uh, so I'm not going to give everything away. Uh, but first of all, I just want to um, kind of introduce you to the concept of how difficult numbers are uh, with this question. Um, I'll get out of your way for a moment. Uh, you'll be able to see a collection of fruit here. And um, what I'm asking is, which ones do you have to count and which ones don't you have to count is the interesting thing here. See, I think, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can look at, for instance, uh, the uh, pairs, and without counting them, you know there's three there. Just try and think about the process that's going on in your head. I think if you're looking at the um, kiwi fruits there, I think you're having to count those. You're having to go through one, two, three, four, five, or whatever it, however many it is, six. Um, I've never said I was a genius. Uh, the palms, um, interestingly, again, I think you can kind of see that without actually counting them. And the point I'm making here, uh, which is a very important point for us to understand, is that no animal, humans included, naturally counts or recognizes a number of units beyond three. So your brain does not look at five objects and say, oh, look, there's five objects. Your brain has been taught to count to five objects. And what we find is with um, most, in, in, you know, what we would call intelligent animals, they can distinguish two from three at a glance, and they can distinguish one from two and one from three. But what they can't do is distinguish uh, six from eight or five from seven. Uh, and actually, only humans can do that because we learn how to do it, because we've realized how valuable it is. So counting is not a natural thing. Counting might feel to you now because you can't remember a time when you couldn't count. It might feel to you like it's a natural thing that humans just do, uh, but they don't. So um, this is a, a slightly technical looking slide, but really what I want to, to, to show you this is a, it's a, um, oh, sorry, hopefully uh, that's the end of the hacking. And um, this is a, what you see on the, on the right there are images um, from a functional magnetic resonance image scanner. And what you see is somebody doing arithmetic inside an fMRI scanner. And what's happening is that the circuits that are lighting up in their brains, the, the, where the blood flow is happening while they do arithmetic, 
are the same circuits that control their finger movements. And when we learn to count, we actually learn to kind of override or write on top of the finger circuits of the brain, the motor controls of the brain for the fingers. We learn to put on top of those our concepts of numbers and arithmetic. So when you do arithmetic, you're effectively doing something similar to moving your fingers, except you're not moving your fingers, you're just counting. And this is something that we do as very young children, obviously in almost all our cultures, is that we learn to count. Many of us use our fingers to count because it's a very easy way to do it. And it's not clear whether um, actually what we're doing is, is uh, because we're using our fingers, we're writing on that circuit or that circuit happens to be the one in which um, the counting sort of seems to uh, get encoded in the brain. But what we, what we see very clearly is, as it says here, activation patterns due to mental arithmetic basically reflect processing based on finger counting. And so there isn't a separate part of your brain that deals with numbers. It's just riding on other things. Numbers are not a natural part of human life. And uh, if, I want to show you this using an example of a tribe, um, an Amazonian tribe called the Piraha, who have no numbers beyond three. And if they uh, have more than three children, and you ask them how many children they have, uh, they will tell you that they have many. And, and that's good enough for them, actually. It's not a problem for them to... to not have these numbers. And I think it's an interesting thing to explore. They're perfectly happy. They don't really understand why people come and investigate them and work and why, you know, why they can't do numbers, because uh, they're perfectly happy with that numbers. Uh, what you see here is, is a, a number matching uh, task that was set them by Daniel Everett. And when he went and did some, uh, some work with his tribe and his uh, book there is in the corner, Numbers. Uh, and he's done a lot of work with the Paraha tribe on their language and on their mathematics. And what he found is that if you, if you pile up, say, 10 AA batteries and then give them, 10, you know, give them a, 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 you know, 15 or so pieces of paper and say, can you just put on the table as many pieces of paper as there are batteries, they will struggle. And they struggle beyond about three or four. And some of them are clever enough to be able to do five or six. None of them manage to do 10. And so they just don't have this concept of even matching, you know, one set of things to another set of things, which is basically how we start out in maths. We, you know, we count apples and we'll say there's one, there's two, there's three. And then, of course, you know, we, we have learned language associated with the numbers that go beyond that. And we have heard, learned all kinds of concepts. But what we don't appreciate is that that does not come naturally. And that is a massive human achievement right there. So if you hate maths and you always hated maths and you had huge difficulty with maths, but you can count to four. Give yourself a clap. <laughs> it, and, it, and this really is the basis for understanding all of this achievement that we can make and how extraordinary it is. So I'm going to start uh, off just by telling you about three mathematicians. I just kind of, just to kind of set the scene on this. And then uh, when we're done with that, I'm going to go through some of the subjects that you might remember from school and tell you what they were really about. So we're going to start with um, this man, John Napier, who um, invented what he called, he invented the word called logarithms. Uh, many of you will remember being at school and being a, given a book of logarithms to work with. And, uh, and what logarithms are, you may not have even known this when you were working with them. I, I can't remember that I did know it. Logarithms are just a way of turning multiplication into addition. Because basically multiplication is quite hard. An addition is quite easy, and the brain can do it well. And John Napier uh, did this uh, and created his table of logarithms, which when he created it, it had 10 million entries, and it took him 20 years to put that original set of tables together, uh, for which you were incredibly ungrateful. And when it was doled out at school, you just went, oh. That was 20 years' work in, in, in that. And uh, what he did uh, was uh, he had seen that astronomers were making mistakes in their calculations. And this was throwing off you know, advances in astronomy. And he wanted astronomers, uh, his contemporaries were people like Kepler, he wanted them to be able to do their calculations more accurately without mistakes and, and basically advance discovery in astronomy as, as much as he could. So he spent 20 years putting together these tables so that they could do their calculations. Kepler was incredibly grateful for this and actually dedicated, uh, after he'd received the table of logarithms to realize how much it was going to uh, impress or improve his work, 
Uh, he was so impressed by it, he actually dedicated his next book to uh, John Napier, uh, who had already died, sadly. Uh, but Clifford was so excited to get the book of logarithms that actually what, uh, he, he was told off by one of his uh, professors, one of his superiors, uh, for being too excited because uh, the professor said it's unseemly for an astronomer to be so excited about the calculations becoming easier, apparently. But what Kepler said was that Napier has basically now doubled the life of the astronomer and that all the stress of getting your calculations right had disappeared. Now, Napier did this, uh, this, this work that he did was actually geometric. Uh, so what he did was he took a load of right angle triangles and we'll get to right angle triangles in a bit, uh, but he worked out the sign of a, of a right angle triangle as he varied the angle. And that gave him a way to actually manipulate any kind of uh, multiplication into an addition. Uh, using laws that, uh, that have been derived about you know signs and causes of all this kind of stuff but don't worry about that we'll get to it but what it did allow him to do was create uh, a thing called the slip stick which allowed him to kind of put his his table of logarithms onto a series of sticks that when you move them against each other the way that he had marked those sticks you could actually do the calculations in a kind of physical way you could see how they were and this eventually was developed into the slide rule uh you'll see a slide rule here uh, I suspect that some of you have, have even worked with slide rules. I don't know if anybody can remember how to use one. And the uh, hands went down there. Um, so uh, slide rules were basically the entire engine of science uh, from sort of the 1600s right through to basically about 1970 when the pocket electronic calculator was invented. Uh, and slide rules, uh, I mean, Newton created his own slide rule effectively, so he did his own design so that he could do his calculations. Um, George Stevenson built a rocket using uh, slide rule based calculations. He, he created his own version of the slide rule that would help him to do his particular work. So the Industrial Revolution was built on the slide rule, which was built on logarithms, uh, which is basically a way of turning addition into uh, multiplication into addition. Uh, Enrico Fermi. Uh, who oversaw the Manhattan Project was never seen without his slide rule. It was always in his pocket and he always would bring it out at, at, at any sort of chance. So when the first atomic pile uh, was, was built uh, in a squash court in Boston and, um, and he had piled up the uranium, they worked out how much they needed to get some kind of positive chain reaction to be self-sustaining. And he, uh, he used his slide rule to do those calculations. And then uh, when the Apollo crew uh, and every Apollo astronaut, in fact, was issued with a slide rule. But when the, the moon landing came in 1969, Buzz Aldrin used his slide rule on the fly to calculate how to get down onto the lunar surface. So this invention of John Napier, you know, hundreds of years before, was still being used at this point and still being pivotal for, for uh, humanity's achievements. Uh, this is a picture of... Um, of, of uh, Buzz Aldrin's side rule here. Uh, it would have cost NASA about eleven dollars uh, to, you know, for each one, and this one sold at auction uh, for seventy-seven thousand dollars. So, hang on to your side rule. You never know. So that's John Napier. Uh, here's Florence Nightingale, who many people know as just a nurse. Um, being a nurse was kind of, in a, in a way, her second occupation because she was. Uh, very much um, right through her training and through all of her career, uh, working as a statistician, a medical statistician. And she worked very hard to make sure that she could improve healthcare through understanding numbers. But most importantly, in a sense, it was through understanding how to present numbers in a way that would really sort of engage people and get change uh, implemented in her sphere. So what you see at the top there is a, is a um, this is a, a graphic that sort of basically derived from what uh, Florence Nightingale first pioneered, which is the idea of illustrating something uh, in a way that means you don't have to understand the numbers, but you get the concept straight away. This is the number of plastic bottles uh, used each year uh, by, I think, I think it's Americans, I can't remember, uh, the details are in the book, but it, it's, it sort of basically creates this pile that sort of overshadows Manhattan. So if you get an idea of how many thousands of millions of plastic bottles we get through, it's probably global annual, but um, you don't need to, to know the numbers necessary to see that that's a lot of plastic bottles. And this is what Florence Nightingale uh, managed to convey with her wedge diagram here. And this was the first um, illustration 
of how you could use statistics or take the statistics and make them presentable and implementable as a change. And so what she showed was that the people, um, the soldiers who were in the hospital at Scutari in the Crimea, uh, were dying much more frequently uh, than the soldiers who were actually in the hospitals at the back and front, where it should have been much worse. It was uh, something like 12.5% of the soldiers in the battle front, uh, battlefield hospitals were dying, uh, versus 37.5% of the soldiers at the Scutari Hospital. And uh, Florence Nightingale sort of investigated this, worked out that it was a lot to do with conditions in the hospital that needed to be improved, and then showed that generally, if you improve conditions, you were going to improve patient survivability. But she couldn't just take that to sort of dry fact uh, to, to her superiors. So she invented a way of representing this in a way that they could see the vast sort of difference and the, the amount of deaths that, that could be avoided. And she wrote this up, uh, she published a book on it. Uh, she gave, she sent a book to the Queen, to Queen Victoria, who, who asked her to come to the palace and explain it to her. And she was uh, basically, um, she then instigated the kind of change in the way that the military operated its, its battlefield hospitals and its, 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 all of its healthcare. Um, as Florence Nightingale says here, diagrams are of great utility for illustrating certain questions of vital statistics by conveying ideas on the subject through the eye, which cannot be so readily grasped when constrained in figures. And, and she was the first to really understand how to do this and how to set it out. She was a great statistician. Uh, she was elected to the Royal Statistical Society um, later on after, after she sort of done all this work, but it wasn't because of her celebrity. It was literally because of how great uh, her work was. Um, in fact, I mean, she was only a celebrity almost by accident in that uh, the whole lady with the lamp thing happened because she, uh, she was patrolling the wards at night when the Times reporter came out uh, to report on the on the situation in the Scutari hospitals and what was happening in Crimea. And he wrote this great piece about, you know, this, this woman who circulates lonely at night just carrying a lamp on and, uh, and you know, she's the only one there. And she looked like this completely heroic figure. The truth is that she had locked all of the other nurses away in their dormitories because they had a, had a habit of hooking up with some of the soldiers. And uh, so she, uh, she locked them in their dormitories at night and kept the key on her. She slept with the key under her pillow uh, to make sure there was nothing, uh, no impropriety going on in her hospital. So maybe not quite the, the, you know, the lady of the lamp. Um, so that's far and night, far and My favorite, uh, I think, uh, these days is uh, King Shulgi of Earth. Excuse me, my drink of water. Now, King Shulgi, uh, so this is 4,000 years ago in what is now, I think, Northwest Iran. Um, King Shulgi uh, was uh, a king who could do maths, and he was very proud of the fact that he could do maths. He was trained in maths as a child, and uh, he was so proud of the fact that he could do maths that he made his subjects sing hymns to him, worshipping him for his mathematical ability. Uh, we know that because we have remnants of the hymns uh, that, that he sung, on, on, uh, written on clay tablets, uh, that, sorry, that were sung to him. Um, he wasn't great at maths by our standards, because we know that he could add and subtract, uh, but as far as we know, he couldn't multiply or divide. So it's amazing what you can get people to worship you for. Um, but King Shulgi, his real innovation and his, the way he changed civilization was that he actually uh, imposed this map. He realized the power of numbers and just adding and subtracting and keeping records of those additions and subtractions meant that he could control the state's finances in a way that had never been achieved before. And so he instigated what scholars call the first mathematical state. And that he said there must be records of every transaction, every piece of work, every sort of um, payment that's made uh, from the state. So the civil service suddenly had to get all their numbers right. Uh, he, he mandated that it was done in a way that was checkable, sort of something like double entry bookkeeping, but not quite like that. And uh, what happened is that all of a sudden the coffers stopped emptying because people couldn't defraud the state anymore. They couldn't just take money because everything was properly accounted. And so he, he uh, took control of the money. Uh, the state became incredibly wealthy. Ur became the largest city in the world at the time. Uh, he had the money to complete his father's venture, which is the great ziggurat of Ur, which you see here. 
Uh, and he also had the money to make uh, roads for trading with neighboring kingdoms. And so all of a sudden, Ur was opened up to, to the world and became effectively the, the massive um, hub for trade uh, across that region and uh, the, the richest state that there was, uh, basically because of addition and subtraction and nothing really much more complicated than that. Uh, so that's an innovation that, that is sort of underrated these days. Um, and if we continue in, into that sort of idea of just keeping control of the numbers, what should be started, uh, this man, this is the bust of Jacques Necker, uh, and what this man started was uh, the French Revolution. He was an accountant. Accountants aren't meant to be that interesting. Um, in fact, when I was researching the book, I, I went, um, sorry, are there any accountants here? Yeah, I, that always happens, yeah, sorry. I, I did say not meant to be interesting, but I know you are interesting. So I, I, when I was researching the book, I uh, contacted people who study uh, uh, the history of accounting, uh, who were very surprised to be contacted and told me that nobody ever talks to them about anything. But actually, I found the, the history of accounting was really interesting. And uh, one of the people that, that, that you know, I think is incredibly interesting and underrated is Jacques Necker, who was the, um, an accountant who became the finance minister in France, who exposed the profligacy of the French royal court. And his records showed that actually uh, they were spending far too much money. There weren't proper records in, in terms of understanding you know, where the national debt was coming from. And he put a lid on it. And uh, of course, uh, at this point, he, he was the finance minister, put a lid on, on the spending of the Royal Court and made it clear, uh, published the accounts, made it clear how much was being spent. But of course, he lost his job straight away. But the fact that he lost his job after sort of doing this public service was a kind of initiation uh, for the French Revolution. And when the people stormed the, the Bastille, they carried busts of Necker on their shoulders. So there's an accountant that's sort of changing world history, which is amazing to me, um, but probably not to the accountants in the world. Uh, and and uh, just to continue the theme, Alexander Hamilton, uh, who is, um, that's not, a, that's actually not a photo of Alexander Hamilton, by the way, uh, but it's the best I could do. Uh, but you know, when you, you, know, you watch the musical Hamilton, you know, it's all, it's all about the, you know, this incredible revolution and these people who are putting together this incredible thing. What happened basically was that Hamilton took control of the money and realize that if you can understand how to have the money working, you can have anything you want. And he took great inspiration from the accounts published by the English and the Dutch courts, uh, showing how their sort of financial systems worked for government. And he said, basically, we've got to do this in America. There were no banks in America at the time. America had no money, uh, but he invented the, you know, he basically invented the American banks. Uh, they were able to create bonds uh, to, to get money into the system and do things like complete the Louisiana purchase and you know, massively expand the size of the United States. And uh, Hamilton was basically obsessed by the idea of order in finances, which somehow didn't make it into the musical at all. Um, so, uh, so by restoring public credit, not by gaining battles. That's how we're finally to gain our object. So he wasn't really interested in the kind of military side of it at all. He was just interested in being able to run a country uh, according to mathematical principles. Now, counting leads you straight into accounting, uh, as we made clear. And then you realize that actually this is what allows you to create what we have now in the modern world. So what we have is uh, systems of, of double entry bookkeeping, uh, which uh, allow us to create a situation, and it happened sort of most in Renaissance Italy, uh, where people started to be able to keep accounts of their businesses that allowed them to separate their businesses from their families. So suddenly it wasn't that you know, such and such was a, was a butcher or a carpenter, uh, and, and you couldn't separate the person from the business. He could then sell his business to someone else because he could just give them the account books and they could see what this business was all about and how much it was worth and where the value lay. And through this uh, uh, invention of double entry bookkeeping uh, and the, the use of double entry bookkeeping, and this is uh, Luca Pacioli who kind of introduced it uh, to, to uh, Northern Italy in the, just, uh, in the 15th century. Uh, so through this kind of thing, you could suddenly have a system where you could buy and sell businesses. And you could also have a business that is separate uh, from, from you. So you don't have to sort of take account of, of everything that goes on in that business. That business is a separate entity, effectively. And this was a great scheme for actually stopping things like kings uh, from stealing your property. Because you'd say, no, you know, this isn't my property as such. It's a business here. You can't just take my ship. You know, it's all accounted for in the books. 
And so it sort of changed the interaction between a, uh, a citizen and state as well. Uh, what you have here in the bottom left hand corner is a Chinese system of uh, positive and negative numbers. Uh, this was, I think, something like, this, I think this has been dated around uh, 200 BC when the Chinese first started using these. And they were used for trade to understand you know, debt and credit and, and borrowing and, and the way in which you could operate uh, all kinds of businesses and operate wills and, and uh, estates and things like that. Uh, it took until, I think it was sort of about 1600 years later before we accepted them in the West, that negative numbers weren't somehow something of the devil. Um, and, and the church was very much against the idea of negative numbers uh, because they said it would encourage people to, to see debt as a sort of normal thing. Uh, so so um, it took a long time before we could have accounting system that really worked in the same way. Um, but this is the root of all our sort of modern corporations in that they exist as entities that are separate from any human being. And they kind of are, are considered to be as entities are in and of themselves, almost as sort of, you know, a strange kind of, of being. Uh, in legal terms. So um, moving from arithmetic, which is, you know, you think fairly straightforward, but actually you know, incredibly uh, transformational in the world, to something like geometry, where you, um, you can basically attribute those numbers that you've created to lines and shapes and kind of put numbers on them. So you can sort of make a, a mathematical statement about a line or a shape, or, um, or, and then you can sort of you know, use that uh, to massive effect. So this is the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Uh, its architects were two mathematicians. And uh, the mathematicians were charged with creating something that was grand and that would uh, impress all the locals uh, because actually the locals had, had knocked down or, or destroyed the building that was on that site beforehand because they didn't like paying the taxes. And so uh, the, the, the uh, I can't remember his name now, the, the uh, leader at the time wanted something that was grand and immovable. Uh, he contracted two mathematicians who had an understanding of shape and, uh, and, and they could create these kind of you know, massive, uh, impressive structures. So the, the top dome there is a hemisphere on a half cube when you analyze it. And uh, creating a way to, to, to sort of build a hemisphere and a half cube at that time, it's incredibly hard to do, except that there were mathematical shortcuts that people knew. So uh, a, a mathematician called Heron of Alexandria had, had written out how to create a dome of any particular size that you wanted. And he had a whole load of shortcuts uh, for doing things like telling the foreman how to, how to sort of size it up and how to measure it out without requiring the foreman to do any mathematics. Uh, there were approximations of pi, because obviously if you're dealing with a hemisphere, you're gonna to need to put pi into the equation. But you need, you, you know, nobody had decimals. Nobody had a way of actually working with the irrational number that is pi. So you had to come up with uh, these sort of shortcuts that, and, Heron of Alexandria wrote all these down uh, that get, basically gave you, you know, if you want a dome of this size, this is how to lay it out. This is the kind of the geometry that you need. And this is the amount of surface area that it will have. So you know how much plaster you're gonna need, for instance. So all of this is written out in these kind of uh, shortcuts. Uh, so mathematicians would have looked very impressive coming up with this kind of thing. But actually, you know, if you know the right place to go, you can get anything done and look good as long as you don't tell anyone your secret. And then uh, you can change the world through navigation, as uh, Christopher Columbus uh, would have been trained in what was the science of right angle triangles. So navigation is basically just dealing with right angle triangles, uh, knowing uh, things like how sines and cosines work and things like that, uh, which of course you'll all remember uh, very clearly. Uh, and you'll remember having those tables of signs and cosines, little booklets. I remember a, a red and white booklet being given out in, uh, in geometry class uh, when I was about eight years old. And I, it used to make my heart sink that this was what I was gonna have to deal with for the next hour or 40 minutes. Uh, but actually it turns out that, that sort of sailors in the, in the 14th and 15th centuries, and the 13th century in fact, uh, also were dealing with these things and they were completely uneducated. So these were sailors who, uh, who would have you know, started being sailors maybe at eight years old or even earlier, and uh, just sort of have a life on board ships with no education whatsoever. But once they got to the point where they needed to be able to navigate, it was incredibly valuable to understand a bit of geometry and a bit of trigonometry and how right angle triangles work. Uh, because that's basically what navigation is. It's understanding that you know, if the wind's going this way and the tide's going that way, you need to sail in a certain other way. And it, this kind of, um, of calculation 
they even had their own sort of versions of, sci of, uh, of these little trigonometry booklets. Uh, they were, didn't involve actually working out in the science or cosines because it was all done for them. But they basically had cheat sheets and handouts for, you know, if, if this is the triangle, that I, or this is the line I want to sail, uh, and this is where the wind's going, and this is the direction I need to take. And this was all done using right angle triangles. Uh, enterprising sailors who knew how to do this, some of them set up sailing schools where you would teach other sailors uh, how to do navigation using trigonometry. And uh, there are records even of um, pirates turning up and paying to be uh, educated in these schools. Because if a pilot can learn a bit of trigonometry, it's much easier to intercept a ship when you know what direction it's going in. Uh, so, so we had records of pirates actually going back to school uh, to learn trigonometry, uh, which is quite extraordinary. And, uh, and then there's art and technology. So uh, if we look at the idea of, of geometry as applied to optics and understand how light enters the eye uh, and comes from a, a distant object via a straight line, as was worked out by the Islamic scholar, Ibn al Haytham. Uh, he showed us that actually you could work out you know, where all these rays of light were coming from and how they would actually intercept something that you put in the way. And so this was used by artists, particularly in the Renaissance, when they really sort of worked out that they could work out exactly what something should look like if they were drawing it in 3D, uh, even though it was actually quite a difficult thing to draw in 3D. So what you find is when these books of Al Haytham were translated uh, from uh, Arabic, into uh, Latin, and they sort of made their way through into the sort of Western uh, Renaissance intellectuals, you suddenly find that art gets a lot, lot better. And you could sort of think, you know, I wonder why this is. And David Hockney has made the, the sort of strong argument that this is basically because of an understanding of geometric optics. Uh, so what you see um, is, uh, for instance, here, uh, I've got a, a, this is a woodcut by uh, Albert Durer. And what he's showing is how you would draw a loop. So this in here is the, um, is the uh, piece of paper, effectively, that you want to draw your loot on. And of course, you know, drawing that perspective, here's, here's where the eye of the observer is. This is where the, the paper would be. This is the frame of the picture. And what you have is these men who are basically simulating the ray of light coming from a particular point on the loot and uh, going to the eye here. And this is where it would cross the picture. So this point here in this frame is where you put that particular point of the loot. And so from that, you you can build up these very accurate perspective uh, paintings and drawings and woodcuts uh, that really sort of just blew people's minds away that you could do this. Just, you know, actually, you didn't have to do it all by eye. You could work it out using, using maths. Uh, what you have on the right here is, uh, is a, a good example of the revolution that came through this in technology terms. Because once you could draw like this and once you could understand perspective, you could draw machines that you wanted to build and you could draw them out using this 3D perspective. Uh, and once you could draw them out, you could see where they wouldn't work. And you could see the bits that maybe moved would move across and block another bit that needed to move. So these 3D drawings sort of made it so that you didn't have to you know, pay a craftsman uh, to build a prototype to find out that he didn't work. And then you'd have to pay him to build another prototype. So, so you could shortcut the process of developing technologies. These are, are pictures that come from Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks. Uh, showing that he you know, he was a great um, admirer of perspective drawing and understanding uh, what it could do for a technology because you can suddenly see the thing as it is rather than a kind of two-dimensional drawing. Uh, incidentally, Leonardo uh, tried to learn how to do fractions and failed. I just thought you'd like to know that. He was supposed to be a genius. Um, he, he couldn't understand why if you divide it by a number that was smaller than one, the answer was bigger. Maybe you can't either. I don't know. So that's a kind of, you know, that's just a quick overview of, of geometry and how it sort of changed our civilization. Um, this is a, a subject you may not have studied at school. Some of you will have studied it in a sort of more advanced mathematics. This is calculus. Calculus is the, basically the maths of how things change. So if I'm changing one thing, how does a related thing change as I change that thing? That's what calculus is. And, and, and it's, it's relatively complicated, it's difficult. It took Isaac Newton and uh, Gottfried Leibniz to, um, to work out you know, how to formalize this mathematics after several, you know, probably a hundred years of, of slow development by others. Uh, but calculus allows you to do things like work out how to put curves together. So if this curve is changing in this way, and I also want this curve and I want it to meet, 
uh, without there being any kind of, you know, kink in the curve effectively. I need to use calculus to put those curves together. And putting curves together was actually vital for creating the elliptical Spitfire wing that you see there. And the elliptical wing was known uh, since, I think, 1903 to be the ideal uh, standard for aerodynamic uh, aircraft in that it basically allowed you to turn very tightly uh, without losing air coming over the wing so that you, could, you wouldn't stall your aircraft if you turn too tightly. So the elliptical wing was the ideal to aim for. And this guy here, Beverly Shenstone, was the guy who actually made it happen and, and worked out how to create an aircraft with an elliptical wing, uh, the Spitfire. And um, uh, Shenstone, he was a, a good student of calculus. He knew his maths. I mean, he actually didn't, knew that he didn't know enough maths. So when he was trying to design a Spitfire wing, he engaged uh, another, a, a proper mathematician from a university near Southampton um, called uh, Raymond Howlett. And Howlett taught uh, Shenstone advanced calculus so that together they could work out how you create this sort of perfect wing shape. So, so and there are, there are notebooks um, showing um, Shenstone's sort of calculations, scribbling in the back of various notebooks that, that he, um, of how he could you know, put together these curves to create the, the Spitfire wing. Um, so actually, interestingly, um, as you'll probably be aware, you know, the Spitfire has been credited uh, widely with uh, winning the Battle of Britain. And, um, and winning the Battle of Britain has actually also been credited uh, with bringing America into the war. So, and bringing America into the war is widely credited as the reason why we managed to, the Allies managed to win the war. So it's an interesting thing to think that all the way back to Shenstone's decision to learn some extra calculus gives us that ability to, to win a world war. This is um, Ralph Ingersoll, a US journalist, uh, who, who is basically sort of seen as the source of understanding uh, why America came into the war. He says, the battle that was fought in the era of London may go down in history as a battle as important as Waterloo or Gettysburg. And that battle essentially was won uh, through um, the use of calculus. Or it's a tenuous argument, but I like it. Uh, calculus isn't always good. Uh, so on, on the right there, you can see uh, the, this is how we cured the HIV, vi HIV virus or, or came up with a triple cocktail of drugs by understanding the calculus of the, the concentration of the virus in the blood as you put in these various uh, pharmaceutical uh, these medicines into the, into the blood, you see that the, the concentration of the virus changed. And so the people who developed the triple cocktail uh, did um, use calculus in order to do that. Uh, but also uh, calculus has been used in the financial industry uh, enormously uh, in the form of differential equations, uh, which uh, soon became something that was sort of lost inside a black box. And so uh, what you had was people with no mathematical education using a mathematical tool that was given to them without any real understanding necessarily of what the, the buttons that they were pressing were. And you ended up with things that were being massively overvalued and you ended up with a, a financial crash. Uh, so, you know, maths can be bad, I'll admit it. And then there's algebra. Algebra is a tricky subject. Anyone remember this equation? Anyone remember this equation? Oh, yes. <laughs> Some of you could probably have recited it if I'd asked. Um, this, um, I mean, we learn this at school, and we learn it as a means to solving quadratic equations. And if you're doing your, you know, when you did your O levels, or when your children are doing, as the mine did, GCSEs, you learn this, and you don't really know why you're learning it necessarily, except to pass an exam. That's my overwhelming sense of, of, of why we learn algebra, is to pass the exam so we can go on to the next thing. And, uh, and that's something we can get into in the Q&A, because I think the sort of maths education is a, is a massive thing that I won't really have time to talk about. Um, but this is actually a, a Babylonian tax calculating formula. So uh, this is what was used, not in this form, because they didn't have uh, symbols, they didn't have symbolic algebra, everything was written out in words until pretty much the sort of 16th, 17th centuries. Um, but what they did was that if they wanted to calculate how much tax uh, to, to charge on, on, a, on a person with a field of a certain size. If it wasn't a rectangle or, or a triangle where you could easily work it out, you had to sort of split it up into ways that, uh, where you ended up uh, with, uh, with a, a formula like this or a, a means of calculating like this that, that sort of gave you a way to work out how much tax to charge. So this was Babylonian civil servants kind of tool number one. And, uh, and 
it's interesting that algebra is sort of known just as an abstract thing, really. I think most of us couldn't sort of necessarily place an understanding of what algebra is for or whether we've ever used it since we were at school. And for most of you, I would say the answer is no, you haven't used it since you were at school, because why would you? I mean, literally, there's no reason, except if you're in a technical profession. But it's nonetheless been incredibly influential in the world. So um, you have things like military technology. So here at the top left, this is uh, Nicola Tartaglia here, who developed uh, the, um, the first sort of algebra of artillery in, in terms of what angle you have your gun barrel at to achieve a certain range when you fire your shot. And Tartaglia actually worked all of this out and worked out the algebra for this. And, uh, and then he realized it was gonna be used to kill his fellow human beings and just burn all of his notes. Uh, and then his uh, sponsor said, no, I need that. And uh, so he had to write it all out again. Conscience will only get you so far. Um, at the bottom here uh, is John Nash, who used algebra uh, to develop, and, and he and his colleagues at the Rand Corporation uh, during the Cold War used algebra, algebra to develop a means of understanding how to balance nuclear arsenals east against west. And actually the, the Nash equilibrium and other game theory advances uh, were used enormously influential in sort of maintaining the peace at this time. Uh, so much so that in 1971, uh, when, uh, when basically nobody from the east was meeting anybody from the west, uh, it was just not allowed. Uh, but the mathematicians were allowed to meet. So in Vilnius in 1971, uh, a group of, of uh, communist mathematicians and Western mathematicians were basically allowed to come and, and talk to each other about their equations and how they worked everything out so that they could be sure that, that everyone was working off the same kind of thing and maintaining that peace through, through the, the very fragile peace through the Cold War. Uh, and that was basically you know, an understanding of algebra. And we come right up to the present day. Uh, this is Anna Moss. Uh, on the right here, who is the, basically the head mathematician for Ocado. Uh, and she, uh, she used to work for Intel, uh, but now she works for Ocado because Ocado and all the other online retailers employ a massive uh, troop each of, uh, of mathematicians to work out exactly how to do the logistics of the supply chains right to the, the point of delivery and understanding the timeframes for deliveries and everything else. It's all done using algebra, I'm afraid. Uh, so those people really are using algebra. And uh, of course, if you've done a Google search at all today for anything at all, you've used algebra because Google was built on a, a paper that was written uh, about uh, a novel use for linear algebra. And it's basically just the Google search algorithm is a good example of the use of algebra in modern life. And so you have used algebra, you just haven't had to work at it. And um, I'm moving on to imaginary numbers now. Now, you may or may not have studied these. I never know who gets to study or who got to study these, who didn't. I remember studying them. How many people here studied imaginary numbers? Oh, marvelous. <laughs> these are my favorite thing in the world, I think. And, um, and they're not imaginary, by the way. I uh, just want to make that very clear. Um, these are, sorry, I'm running over time. Uh, imaginary numbers are what you get when you play around with the idea of square roots. So square roots is the opposite of squaring a number. So squaring a number, two times two is four, but also minus two times minus two, minus two squared is also four. So the square root of four is two or minus two. But what happens if you start with a minus four and say, what's the square root of minus four? And the right answer is it can't be done because there's no way you can go that way and square something and get minus four. So if you've got the square root of minus four, you've surely done something wrong. Well, this is what people thought. And then a guy called Jerome Cardano, who is the, by the way, the quantum astrologer that I wrote about in the quantum astrologer's handbook. Uh, he said, no, this is, there's something here. I think we need to take these sort of imaginary, sorry, uh, we need to take these negative square roots seriously. And he, they came up in his uh, derivations of solutions for a cubic equation, a quadratic equation, actually. And uh, he just worked through them and sort of kept them in. And they disappeared again, and he was able to solve his equation. It's fine. He said, oh, that's interesting. You know, these things, I think somebody should sort of probably do something about these, but not me. And, uh, and we sort of started to use them for a few hundred years, but they really came into their own at the end of the, the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, 
when people were looking for a way to electrify uh, a nation. So how to produce, you know, we had elect electricity, we wanted to electrify towns and cities. And actually the circuitry involved was incredibly complicated to work out because if you wanted to work it all out, you had to do these massive equations uh, that engineers just couldn't handle at all. There was no way to, to solve them. And then uh, a man called uh, Charles Brotus Steinmet basically came up with a way of using imaginary numbers and shoving them in instead of some of the angles and the sines and the cosines that were there. He shoved them in, and this is not the technical term, uh, but it, it basically created a way to simplify the equation. So imaginary numbers became central to everything that electrical engineers were doing right from the end of the 19th century, uh, right through. This is a page uh, that comes from uh, um, David uh, Packard's master's thesis. And David Packard uh, is one half of Hewlett Packard, and his friend Bill Hewlett uh, basically lent him his garage, and together they worked out how to build this uh, thing that we described in the circuit, which is an audio oscillator. And they produced their first Hewlett Packard device, which was called the HP200B, because they didn't want people to think that they'd only just come up with it. So, uh, so they, they basically produced this. Uh, created a series of audio oscillators, uh, some of which got used uh, in the first sort of cinematic uh, work with Fantasia, which uh, was incredibly sort of important in terms of the development of cinema and understanding, you know, cinema sound and that ability to create these incredible soundscapes came from this work with imaginary numbers. Uh, you can also trace uh, from uh, the electrification of America through to the radio revolution then through to, um, there was a guy called Leo Fender who ran a radio repair shop, decided to, he would also work out how to build a, a guitar amplifier. Uh, and then the, there was a guy called Jim Marshall who ran a, a shop selling Fender amplifiers who said that they weren't very good. And he got an electrical engineer to improve them and came up with the Marshall amp. Um, and so we have, all of this basically involved working with these things called imaginary numbers that people didn't really understand what they were for. And of course, the iPhone and all modern electronics uh, is, is crucially dependent in its design on imaginary numbers. But interestingly, um, and I won't go into this too much because I really haven't got time. But uh, if you go to the, the Hatter's Tea Party in Alice in Wonderland, what you'll find if you mine through the subtext of what's going on there is it's a critique uh, or a parody or a satire of imaginary numbers, but not, not the ones that are just one dimensional, but four dimensional imaginary numbers called quaternions. And they were being introduced to the syllabus that, he, that was being taught to undergraduates at Oxford, where Charles uh, Dutchson, Lewis Carroll, uh, was, uh, was teaching maths and he hated them. And he said, we shouldn't be teaching anything that isn't in Euclid, basically, that wasn't written you know, a thousand years ago. And, uh, and he hated the idea, but the Dean was making him teach these quaternions. And so he, uh, one of the things about quaternions is, I can't remember if this is on here, um, it might be, yeah. So, so they're written with this formula, the sort of, the three dimensions are normal numbers that you and I know, and then i, j, and k, which are the three sort of extra dimensions. And when you multiply them, you have to multiply them in certain order, because i times j is not the same as j times i. So while three times two is the same as two times three for us, if you're working with these four dimensional imaginary numbers, you can't go round the wrong way. You get a different answer. And uh, this is one of the things about all the rotations around the table in the, in the Hatter's Tea Party. And the fact that, um, that, that Dutch Dodson writes things like, um, mean what you say is not the same as say what you mean. And all of this is a kind of poke at uh, Dean Liddell, who is the Dean that's made him, uh, write, uh, made him teach these, uh, these ridiculous subjects. Uh, and the reason why it would be particularly pleasing to him is that his daughter was Alice of Alice in Wonderland. So he would have had a copy of this on his coffee table and, and Charles Dutchman would no, no, long, uh, no doubt sort of snigger to himself at the idea that he got some kind of satire sneaked into the Dean's house. So you know, these strange numbers even have resonance uh, in, our, in our literature, which is extraordinary to me. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm just gonna briefly sort of tell you about uh, Claude Shannon who came up with a thing called information theory that you won't have studied at school because it's sort of beyond the curriculum that, that, that anybody studies at school. But the information theory is essentially the understanding of how to encode information and how to encrypt information and how to make very efficient signals, the kinds of signals that you can send off into space 
or, or you can send with a probe, and the probe can send them back with very low power and send you pictures of extraordinary things in space. And so all of this was basically developed by this guy, Claude Shannon, who, um, as it turned out, also really liked to juggle while unicycling. He was an extraordinary man and uh, liked by everybody around him. He was the first person to, to develop a wearable computer, and he developed it uh, to go to Las Vegas and see if he could win at roulette. Interestingly, the um, Shannon's information theory about encoding and encryption is what lies behind all of our uh, encryption in terms of online shopping and everything that we use uh, to encrypt our credit cards and everything else. Uh, but it's also used um, by NASA during the, the Apollo uh, missions as a means of communication and efficiently encoding uh, signals so that the, the astronauts could communicate with each other or with them um, with ground control and that they could send the tele uh, telemetry data of the spacecraft back uh, so that the adjustments could be made uh, to the trajectories of the spacecraft, etc. And so Shannon's work is right, sort of right at the center of this. And I went through a, a phase of when I was researching the book of digging and digging and digging, trying to find exactly how Shannon's work had been implemented by NASA for the Apollo program. And I hit a dead end with a certain paper, uh, which basically was the, the root paper for how Shannon uh, information theory was being applied uh, to NASA's signaling system, communication signaling. Uh, it's called the uh, Apollo Unified S-Band Mode, uh, is the way they, they did it. And uh, I asked them for this particular paper, uh, the design philosophy of modulation indices for Apollo Unified S-Band Mode with ranging. And I had been through so many NASA technical papers, and it, it all came down to this one. And th this is the one that was referenced by everybody. It's like, this is the one we use. And this is where all the secret source is for, for using Shannon's work. And NASA won't let me see it. Uh, it says, they said to me by email, the document is not classified, but it is restricted to NASA personnel only and cannot be released to the public at this time. This paper was written in 1965. Feels like it's time. Um, when I, uh, somebody pointed out to me that this might actually be still, still you know, restricted uh, because it's the same system that's being used effectively to communicate with the Voyager probes and, uh, and other things which may possibly be interfered with if somebody got hold of the actually you know, encoding information that's written in that paper. So maybe I'll, I'll stop asking, but uh, it just seemed ridiculous to me at the time. And uh, it's all, um, all of, all of Shannon's work was inspired by work by George Boole, uh, Boolean Logic, uh, which I won't go into right now uh, because I'm massively overrun. <laughs> so um, essentially what I'm saying and my, my sort of uh, take home really from this is that we learn mathematics as something essentially for most of us as something to learn so that we can pass exams. Because we do the arithmetic stuff, and that's sort of fine. And we can all you know, do basic arithmetic. You know, for some, it might be a bit of an effort, but we can do it. 49% um, uh, I think it is, of UK adults can only do the maths that they learned at primary school. Which kind of makes you wonder what we did with all the rest and where it's gone in our heads. Because we all spent five years at secondary school, at least, learning more mathematics than that. Uh, so where is it all? Well, it turns out it was all useful in the past, but probably not terribly useful for us today. So you can rest easy about that. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much for that. Uh, very entertaining. And uh, that's right. Um, so Michael is ready to answer your questions. And I have a little pile of them here, but I have, I have one of my own first. You, you were talking fairly early on about people counting on their fingers. I was shocked to find that most people count on their fingers in base 10. What would it take to make to get people to count on their fingers in binary? Because you can count up over a hundred times. <laughs> it, it becomes a lot more complicated though, doesn't it? So, so it, no, it really does. Um, and it, I mean, this is no, nobody's quite sure why we have the base 10 number system that sort of works so well. But actually, um, most people think it's probably to do with the fact that we have 10 fingers and 10 toes, and that works really easily. Um, but there are other, other systems for counting where 
Um, people will use knuckles, for instance, so you know they'll get up to much higher numbers just using their, you know, using certain joints um, and, and counting that way. It's just a, basically a way of remembering um, what's in front of you, effectively. So, um, but counting in base twelve, I mean, happens. You know, obviously, with you know, this is how we do clocks. Uh, and, and the 360 degrees of the circle comes down to the Babylonians and their sort of use of uh, the, the sexagesimal uh, system. So, so there are different systems. I've never heard of anybody wanting to count in binary on their fingers, though. Just, uh, you can count me out. <laughs> and this, uh, this question is kind of in similar vein, but from somebody else. Are there any number systems more in line with the way we think? So rather than real stroke imaginary stroke vectors or tensors, would they have their own axioms? Uh, that's a very- You, you um, can ask the person who asked it to quit, to clarify it if you wish. I mean, axioms in mathematics are just the assumptions that we make in order to build up a system for doing mathematics. So um, and this is already deeper than I really want to go. But um, so, so we have an axiom that says one plus two is the same as two plus one. For instance, and from that we can build up how to do arithmetic. Uh, in uh, Euclidean geometry, uh, you can have um, there's a, a unique line that runs between any two points on a plane, and you, from that you can build up sort of various things in geometry. So, so an axiom is just an assumption that, that you can't prove, but, but makes sense. It's kind of your observation of how the world works. Um, in terms of other number systems, I, I mean, just to be clear there's no sort of natural human number system so there isn't you know we don't really have much of a choice in terms of you know we want to learn to count the stuff that's in front of us basically because we found that useful so we teach that to our children very early on and people learn to count in pretty much the same way all around the world. Uh, and people don't really use i mean you can use some different sort of base number systems um attempts to build the accounts. So it's very important that everybody works from the same system. Uh, I'm not sure if that really answers anybody's question, but uh, that's probably the best I can do. Thank you. Um, the next question appears to have been written by a doctor. <laughs> Fortunately, I have a pharmacist. <laughs> Something in experiments with shout out. Hang on, I'll bring the microphone. Hang on, most people won't hear you. <coughs> Time in the use of this phonics. And they found that some people come because they hear the numbers and I use the language numbers. Some people come because they see the numbers. That's I mean that's very interesting. Um I, I couldn't tell you because I'm too used to working with numbers, I think, which I see, and it would depend, you know, what stage of life you were at, and presumably there are people who um don't have any sort of concept of numbers beyond there's a thing in front of them and there's this many of them but they were all postdocs okay so so they were people who were used to working with numbers and i don't know i mean i sort of feel like we see numbers so if you look at a die for instance you know you you, you see the number six because it's two rows of three dots on a die and you see that and you don't count those you just see that there's a number six and uh, the number five again is a recognizable pattern and it may well be that people represent numbers in their heads in that kind of way in that you know the, the, they have certain patterns associated with them but these are people who will have worked with numbers very closely their whole lives uh, i think most normal you know semi-achievers uh, who aren't Feynman's doctoral students uh, probably have a very basic concept of what numbers are and and how they represent them and and for some people it would just be you know if you ask them the question they'll panic because they don't even know how to sort of deal with numbers 
on a kind of normal basis. The next, the next question stands out for its legibility. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it says, are you drinking hand sanitizer? No need to answer that. <laughs> They were referring to all the problems. It's just gin. <laughs> Obviously, yeah, everyone can. It's, it's really just water. I think it's uh, the most. Uh, I get such terrible looks when I uh, when I drink from this uh, at events, and actually, it's just water. It's just a water bottle. I suppose it's possible they were offering to buy you one, but I think it's the bar. <laughs> uh, are the sorry, I can't quite read the tribe you mentioned. Um, unique in the in uh or are there other indigenous people with the same perspectives um as far as i'm aware the piraha tribe and one other amazonian tribe i can't remember their name but again very remote people and this is starting to change now as they're being more and more in contact with the kind of outside world um but as far as i know these are the only two cultures that have never developed a system of numbers i, I may be wrong on that but that's as far as i know um, and the interesting thing is that, that they, they don't feel the need to develop a system of numbers either. They're perfectly happy without it. And they also, in their linguistic work, in, their, in the way they, they speak and the way their language is constructed, uh, I think they have very interesting kind of perspectives on future and past as well. And they, they talk about the way you're facing in terms of future and past. It's all, all linguistically, it's all interrelated. Uh, so they just have constructed a different way of, of sort of having a perspective on the world, really. Um, but they they are apparently an incredibly happy and contented and fulfilled people without numbers at all. So I don't know if that makes you jealous. And the next question, I'm not sure if it was written by somebody who came in late or whether they fell asleep during the talk. They're saying, has anyone written a chronological history of maths? Which is what I thought. Oh, I, well, I mean, actually, my book isn't chronological, and it, it's it's split into subjects that, that you did at school. So there's a chapter on algebra, there's a chapter on geometry, one on arithmetic, uh, one on calculus, one on imaginary numbers, one on statistics. Uh, so so it's not chronological. Um, there is a chronological book, and I can't for the life of me remember its name, but I do reference it in the book. Um, it might come back to me. Uh, and catch me at the end, and I can definitely look it up for you. Um, another legible question How do you deal with people who are saying, oh, I've never been any good at maths, I can't do maths? Uh, how do I deal with it? Well, I, I don't deal with them as such. I was interested that in your family it was perfectly acceptable not to be any good at maths, um, because I think that's quite a common thing. Uh, and it's a common thing in our culture, definitely, that people will say, oh, I'm never any good at numbers, in a way that you would never say about literacy. So people would never say, oh, I can't really do reading and writing. And actually, you know, they're, they're sort of both incredibly important in terms of um, achieving in society, uh, in, in work, professionally. If you can't handle numbers, the number of sort of jobs that are open to you is incredibly limited. And this is one of the problems, I think, with people failing uh, in maths at school and, and school failing them in their maths education, is that it closes off an enormous number of opportunities for people uh, just because we're not very good at taking people forward in maths. Now, one of the um, really awful statistics that I heard from maths education people is that um, you can identify the people who are going to fail their GCSE when they come into secondary school. Because there's a, there's, it's just, you can do a certain test at 11 years old, and the system doesn't do anything for the kids who fail that test to, for them to be able to pass GCSE. So if you, if you come into secondary school being quite good and confident at maths and with, confident with numbers, then you'll have the, the basis on which you can build and get through and, and pass your GCSE. But there is a whole load of people who have been failed by the system basically before they're 11 years old and they never get any value added to their or they don't get enough value added through those five years of secondary education and and so you can tell you know and, and that that to me is a failing of the system because if you can identify those people that you should be helping those people and, and there shouldn't be a correlation between how bad you are at maths at 11 and how bad you are at 16. 
That said, um, we have lots of people go through the system and by the time they're 14 or 15, they, um, they sort of shut themselves off from that. They've said, oh, maths isn't my thing. You know, I, I don't really like it. I'll do the bare minimum I have to to get through. I don't understand it. I will never engage with it again once I've left school. And basically my, my daughter was pretty much this person actually. Um, and, uh, and she, and it's a particular problem with girls in maths education. Uh, and we have you know, far fewer girls than boys doing maths A-level, for instance, partly because of this. Maths anxiety disproportionately affects girls as well. So they, um, girls seem to have this confidence uh, lacking in maths, in their maths ability, even when they're perfectly as good as all the other boys in the subject, they feel they're not as good. So we're doing something wrong there and there's, there's sort of problems in that. But it closes off opportunities. So with my daughter, she, uh, she, she got her, a C in her maths GCSE. She just about did it. She, she basically wanted pretty much nothing to do with maths again ever in her life. But then she realized that she, she wanted to become a nurse. And so she had to um, have basic numeracy and the ability to do maths. And it, I mean, she needed that, that C at GCSE. But there's a whole load of people who, who don't get that, who want to go into a profession like nursing. And then they have to do, they either have to give up that idea or they have to go back and do some kind of remedial work to pass their maths GCSE. And actually there's sort of not a need for nurses to be able to solve quadratic equations or simultaneous equations or multiply matrices. It's a sort of basic arithmetic thing that, that you need to be able to do. And so some maths educators I've spoken to say that one of the things that we really need to do is introduce a different kind of qualification where we have say at age 14, a basic maths or basic arithmetic a numeracy capability that is certificated that we can say these people are really quite they're fine with numbers and, and maybe they would get or have been put off by all the other extra things the quadratic equations or whatever else but actually they're, they're fine with the sort of maths that you need to do a job like nursing and everything else so so there's a question over what qualification you need because some of that um that sort of attitude of I can't do maths, I don't want to do maths, I don't want to have anything to do with numbers, really isn't because you're not very good at maths or, or, or you haven't got those basic math skills. It's that certain things have just put you off and you just encountered this thing where you think, I can't do this or it makes me anxious. And I think we need to be able to get beyond that. But I think society, as a society generally, we shouldn't accept this idea that being bad at maths or being afraid of maths is any better than being afraid of words. Yeah, I quite agree. I was, I was the fourth of five, uh, the only scientist, the only one to go to university. Um, and I would have struggled to pass GCE, but for an exceptional maths teacher that right. I had in, yeah. in that fifth year. Um, and yeah, the, the calculus bit, I was sort of, I could never get my head to yeah. I could never really understand the why and so i kind of put it out of mind but i think there shouldn't be any shame associated with not being able to do maths at 14 15 16, you know what what we call you know this maths that we do on the curriculum there shouldn't be shame associated with it because people's brains develop at a different rate and there are plenty of people who are confused by um things in maths at age 12 that if they were allowed to have you know another couple of years and come back to them they would be fine because actually brains develop in different ways and at different speeds. And one of the things you need, we need, but we can't do with the way we run mass education is to kind of give people a bit more space and time as it is, you know, you have to do this now and then you have to do that and then you have to do that. So if you struggled with that, yeah, you know, and you're automatically feeling anxious about the fact that you failed all those tests, then it's very difficult to then pick yourself up again. That, that same teacher advised me that I would do very badly at a level in two years, very well in three. <laughs> Final question for tonight. Do you think there would have been an industrial revolution without Napier? Oh. Yes, almost certainly, because everything gets done by somebody else if you leave it long enough. So I mean, you know, Einstein developed relativity, but but it would have been you know done by somebody else within five years after that. So so things do get done by other people. Um, and Napier's idea was a brilliant one to, to find a trigonometric way to turn multiplication into addition. And it was brilliant. And um, funnily enough, once it was done, um, there was a, a guy who, uh, who worked with him after to say, uh, it's quite good what you've done, but it's not quite perfect. And then they spent another uh, eight years, I think it was, sort of perfecting the system before we, they published this thing. 
So um, there are always people around with a good idea and, and very few, I think the myth of the sort of genius who nothing would ever have happened without this person, you know, it's just not, not going to be the case. I think without the certain impetus of you know, wanting to improve astronomy, so you have to have a motivation to do these kinds of things, I think. Uh, just as with you know, Beverly Shenstone designing the elliptical wing of the Spitfire, you know, he had a very good reason to, to want to do that. And that he was being incentivized by the MOD to, to basically come up with, a, you know, or, or Supermarine were being incentivized to come up with a, a very good new fighter aircraft uh, for obvious reasons of what was happening in the world. So uh, I think, you know, these things do always happen. Napier was incredibly prescient in doing what he did. I mean, other people turned it into a slide rule. So he produces slip sticks. Other people said, oh, you know, let's, let's make a, you know, a, this other thing, a slide rule. And then other people developed on that and that and that. So I get the impression that somebody would have worked out eventually that, that you know, you could make calculation easier in, in the way that Napier did. But, you know, to be fair to him, he did put 20 years into it. So. Okay, I think we probably better wrap it up there. We've just had a uh, notification that my poor vehicle has fully recharged. <laughs> <laughs> he is no doubt pleased to get on his way back uh, to Lewis. Uh, but thank you very much, Michael, for coming over to talk to us tonight. Um, it's been a very entertaining, informative, and reassuring uh, introduction <laughs> to mathematics. Thank you very much for having me.